case you missed it, Scott, uh, you shared a very powerful story about the suicide of your father that you witnessed. And I just want to kind of stop there for a minute. What What were you thinking? What were you feeling during that time? I mean, I, I love how you said that you actually had a little bit of a sense of relief in some ways. And I can understand that given what you guys went through. What was that like? Um, the thing about growing up in an abusive home is you don't realize it's not the norm. Yeah. Um, so to me, it was I was alone. I was I was orphaned. I felt a tremendous responsibility to my brothers. Mm -hmm. um, even though I was the middle child, I had always been the one that kept things calm, mm -hmm. um, which is probably not the healthiest thing in the world. You were the peacekeeper. I was, mm -hmm. and um, and so it was. My biggest fear was growing up from beyond that was that I would again face that that decision mm -hmm. and be responsible for somebody else's death because I felt really responsible for yes. for not having yes. knocked the glass down. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's heavy, very heavy. And the rational mind says he'd found another, he would have found another way, he had a gun, he, you know, um, but the emotional, the, the nine-year-old child that still lives inside me Mm -hmm. um, holds to the the belief that it's his fault. Mm -hmm. You are not responsible for that. You are not responsible for that, Scott. I know. I know you've been told that millions <laughs> of times. I tell myself that all the time. You are not so. responsible. Your dad was an adult. You were a child. Yeah. Nothing a child does is they're responsible for when it when it comes to being abused and neglected and yeah. abandoned. Not your fault. Period. Yeah. Not your fault. I know. Not your fault. Redeemed, you were redeemed. <laughs> yeah. Now you are. And yeah. you, it took a long time to get to that point, didn't it? Well, Ed, and it's funny because even my um, my moment of salvation, my moment of accepting Jesus, growing up, no Jesus um, represented in my life, other than um, I read a m wonderful book by Donald Miller um, called Father Fiction, and it, it deals with the fact that there are 24 million children in America without fathers in their home. Mm. Um, and the statistics on children in fatherless homes are they're like 20 times more likely to commit suicide, they're much more likely to get involved in drugs. 98% of prisoners in juvenile system came from fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. It's um, something I have a passion for. Exactly. Um, experienced that loss myself. and. Um, I think that's where God's called me. Exactly. Is to try to fill that void. Um, when I was, my youngest was, or my oldest was five years old. I have two sons. Um, I was constant, I would play racquetball with uh, Pastor Mark, your pastor. And he invited me to Promise Keepers. And uh, the thing about Mark is he is a, um, tremendously mediocre racquetball player. <laughs> so I didn't want to lose him as a partner. <laughs> so I went. <laughs> and talk, it was a major culture shock because there were people lifting their hands this way and that way. Because you weren't yet a believer yet? I was not, never even, like I said, I've been to church right? once. Yeah. You're Mark's neighbor, yeah. Well, our kids were nemesis and nemesises in kindergarten. Okay. Uh, David and his oldest we're constantly fighting, okay. but somehow we got a friendship out of that. Yeah. Um, so I'm in this this room at Arco Arena, and have n never experienced anything like this because I've, like I said, church and me just never met, and um, people crying, and I'm trying to figure out where do I put my hands for the best reception, <laughs> and um, the speaker came up was Franklin Graham. Mm. And suddenly I had just this image of my dad's glass. Mm. And the word forgiveness just kept vibrating in my mind. And um, <laughs> I, I didn't hear anything Franklin Graham said, but the moment was taken over by my father's glass and the need for forgiveness and the need to forgive. And I gave my life to Jesus that night. Mm. Um, 
and spent the next five years trying to figure out what that meant. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. I, I, to be honest, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. Mm -hmm. but it's a journey. <laughs> it's a process for all of us. But um, mm -hmm. I know that soon after I got involved in youth ministry at the Nazarene Church, and for some reason God had gifted me with, I'm a teenage whisperer. Yeah. I just am able to They're relate to, to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and. I, I enjoy their company more than grown men. I get lost in grown men conversations because I can't talk about construction. I don't like talking about my job. And it's just, just the sports I can talk about a little bit, but even that I get bored for after mm -hmm. a while. But um, conversations with teenagers come naturally to me. I think because there's no small talk with teenagers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all real. Here's something real. Let's talk about it. And, uh, you know, or there's playfulness, but there's no talking about the weather. There's no yeah. the things that I never developed those social skills. Um, Which I think is in some ways a, a real blessing because there's a depth there, yeah. you know, and um, there's an ability to connect. On, <clears throat> pardon me, to connect on a deeper level. Yeah. And get right to the heart of things. You know. Well, in this generation especially is is. Um, they're, because of social media, they, they long for real conversations. Yeah, connection. Yeah, mm -hmm. because they spend a lot of time connecting at such a surfacey level. Cyber level, yeah. 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 Um, that real connection just, it fills a void for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, beyond that, there's so many of them that don't have a father in their home that they're, they're drawn to a male figure in their life that is not, um, inter you know, hitting on their mom or interested in them in, a, in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. Just having a presence in their life that is just there to love on them mm -hmm. in a healthy mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, it's not a cliche, although some people may think it is when we say that, um, that God works all things together for good. Mm -hmm. And to listen to your story, um, you know, and, and someone may think, well, you, he had to suffer tremendously. Where was God in that? You know, that's what people may say. Yeah, but throughout th throughout the years, it's one of those things where you look back and you wonder how you got where you are. Because both my brothers went down very bad, terrible paths. Um, my older brother got heavily into drugs, uh, and he's in recovery now and has been for a long time, uh, five years. So he's five years sober. But praise but the his, Lord. Yeah, but his path was just self-destructive as I mean he would spend some time homeless yeah um, my younger brother and I can understand why yeah I mean look at the pain oh yeah and he I was mean. he had the disadvantage of being my father's favorite punching bag so um, so his he, I think he had it worse than me um, and my younger brother ended up dying 22 years ago from AIDS mm -hmm. um, so he, he, you know, he made some some bad decisions early and it was at a time when when they didn't really understand what AIDS was it was like it, the risk there was wasn't tell nobody was saying don't do these things it was hidden it yeah. was hidden and misunderstood and yeah and shame was shame built into it and, and basically ostracized and yeah, marginalized. And I watched him. Like a leper. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he, he experienced that. And, mm -hmm. and the people that were telling him that um, that God hates him are the very people that were supposed to be telling him that God loves him. <laughs> and, and so that was a real obstacle to me when I came to faith because I had to, to deal with the ghost of my brother and, and you know how he would perceive this, mm -hmm. which is why... My faith has always had to be honest and and non cliche. I, I I strive to read Bible. I read through the Bible every year. Have since my conversion, mm -hmm. and I don't you know I don't have a bumper sticker faith. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in a bumper sticker faith mm -hmm. because I've always got my little brother to um, to answer to in my in my mm -hmm. heart mm -hmm. and. He was, he, I don't believe he ever rejected Jesus. I think he rejected the fake Jesus that was yeah. presented to him. Yeah, the church is not perfect, yeah. you know, and so. some of, some of the, the world's view of the church is perception, and some of it is based on our 
our actions. Yeah. And um, it's heartbreaking. I also have a heart for the lost and a heart for the real Jesus to meet people where they really are yeah. and change their lives because um, my story is not exactly like yours, but I have a story. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when you've experienced that and then you meet the Christ who saves our Savior and you, and you meet Him face to face and you experience His love that just changes you, yeah. You know, the love that you that you never had and it just changes you and it's so real. I think it's just you just from that point you move forward you move forward and just that profound like desire to let people know about yeah. it. About the real Jesus, you know. Yeah. The one that loves and changes us, you know, and yeah. doesn't condemn us, but he changes us so that we can live right lives. Mm -hmm. You know? Well and when we changed church, a big part of that was we spent time away from the church because for some reason the church we were at, your church was no longer home for us mm -hmm. and that had a lot to do with us it had a lot to do with other people but it wasn't it wasn't that we were in any way i love your church yeah. i love the people in it but it didn't have there were things that were a certain way that didn't fit with how we wanted to minister mm -hmm. um most more my wife than myself but um God moved you somewhere else. Yeah, and we spent a year away from church, and, and in that in that year, I discovered how to minister outside the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. How to, you know, my passion was still for youth, but I no longer had a youth group, so I started volunteering with um, Amateur High School, teaching improvs, because I had spent seven years as a improv performer, mm -hmm. comedy improv in nightclubs, and I'd watched amateur shows, and, and they lacked true understanding of, of the philosophies of improv. Mm -hmm. And so I volunteered, and it's been wonderful. God's used that. We're on that note, we're going to take a quick break. Okay. We'll be back in three minutes. Please stay tuned for more.